So we're, uh, we're covering Jesus' lengthy teaching section that occurs while the Lord is sharing the Passover meal on the night before He dies. Let's do a little review, not of the scriptures, but of the events that have taken place so far. Uh, he's washed uh, His apostles' feet. He's revealed the traitor among them. Uh, prophesied concerning His death and resurrection. He's also promised to send them the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit. He's also encouraged them to bear spiritual fruit in His absence, love one another as He has loved them, and continue in ministry despite the opposition that they'll face. Uh, kind of a, a busy schedule, you know? a, a lot of things that He said to them uh, in a short amount of time. So in our lesson today, uh, Jesus will continue encouraging the apostles as he refuse, reviews rather, with them what will take place in the near future. Uh, but this time, what's different is the apostles are going to start grasping what he's talking about. So far, he's been telling them things are going to happen and they're going, uh-huh, 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 but you know, I don't think they, they fully grasp it. But now they're starting to get the idea that trouble, trouble is coming, okay? So let's get to uh, chapter 16. In the first four verses of this chapter, um, merely a continuation of what Jesus was saying in the previous chapter, which we discussed last time. So let's read verses one to four. It says, these things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So the things that he, you know when he says, these things I told you, the things that he's referring to uh, are that they must bear fruit and they must love each other and they must persevere in ministry. Those are the things that he's referring to. And he's saying, you need to keep doing these things despite the fact that the world is going to hate you, despite the fact that the world will reject you, that the world will not recognize you, that the world will persecute you, that the world will disobey the word that you speak. And the world will also do all of this because it rejects the Son and the Father who sent him. So, the warning is given because all of these things are going to happen. So be ready, he says, for them. Jesus says that he has warned them in advance of these things so they won't stumble. Now the word stumble here means to lose faith or to begin to doubt or to lose their way or to fall down spiritually, the idea of stumbling you know, spiritually. In other words, if they know in advance they'll be prepared for the rough time and they won't be discouraged uh, to the point of quitting. Now, in this passage, unlike the previous one, Jesus describes in more detail how the people's rejection of the Christ will affect them personally. You know, Peter said earlier that he'd follow Jesus anywhere. Now Jesus reveals to Peter and the others the full extent of their suffering in the future. Uh, they'll be rejected by their own countrymen. I think that's the one that really hurts, to have that type of rejection. They'll be you know, disfellowshipped from their re religious past. Uh, they'll be cut off from their families and communities because the synagogue was the center of life for the Jew and they'll be cut off from that. They will be uh, martyred, but their killing will be especially difficult for them to bear because they will be executed by those who claim to be doing the work of God. You know? In other words, they will not die as heroes in the eyes of the people. It's one thing to be a martyr and have people standing by saying, wow, look at you, you know, you're a martyr and you know, you, you know, you're dying for the cause and boy, you're doing a lot of good for the cause, you know, way to go. You know, that's one thing to die like that. But to die when the majority opinion is good riddance, 
this guy was a curse to begin with, you know? We're doing God a favor by getting rid of this guy. I don't know about you, but I'd be having some doubts there. So Jesus repeats the idea that the reason for all of this is because they have rejected both the Father and the Son. Remember, he, he tell, in today's language, He's telling them, it's not about you. They'll be doing this to you, but it's not about you. It's about me. It's about me and the Father. So in this, they will later find comfort that their suffering is connected to their faith in Christ. So in this verse, uh, in verse four that we just read, uh, Jesus also repeats that He is giving them this warning so they will know and be prepared in advance for the hard times ahead. Now He says that while He was with them, there was no need to tell them. But now that they're going to be alone without Him, they need this knowledge to protect not to protect their lives. He's telling them, most of you will lose your life. No, he's telling them to protect their faith. And sometimes I think we ought to say things like that to people who are becoming Christians. A lot of times we, we study with people you know, who, are, who, are, who are becoming Christians, you know, their faith is beginning to develop and we bring them along and so on and so forth and at some point they're baptized and we rejoice at the idea that they've taken that step of faith. But we don't, we don't tell them enough of what might come afterwards, that it's not going to be that easy. The baptism part is usually the easiest part, you know? but later on there's going to be some challenges. And I think sometimes we don't talk enough about the cost of discipleship as Jesus is saying this to them. So anyways, his warning is complete. Jesus goes ahead to make four promises to his apostles, and that's the section that we're going to cover. Four promises he makes to them. Promise number one, the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has mentioned the Spirit before, but he adds new details concerning his coming at this time. So first of all, he talks about the condition of his coming. Verses five to seven, he says, but now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus reviews their reaction to the news of his departure. They're saddened and they're confused about you know, exactly where is he going. Jesus reassures them concerning his departure saying that his leaving will bring a great blessing to them. Of course, all they can see is that their leader is leaving and the problems that this will cause them. Now what they can't see, but what Jesus refers to here, is the mighty work that he will accomplish with his cross and resurrection. They don't see that yet. They don't get that that's coming. They don't understand that that's going to happen. What he's promising them is this new power that they will have when the Spirit will come to them. So, the Holy Spirit can only begin His work in and for the apostles after Jesus accomplishes His mission. This is why it is advantageous to them and why Jesus needs to go. Not only I need to go back to the Father, I need to leave you to do what I came to do, which is to die on the cross and so on and so forth. I need to leave you first and then I can send the Spirit who will do the work within you. Uh, another um, condition of the coming uh, or another explanation of what the uh, Holy Spirit is going to do uh, is the work, the work that the Spirit will do. It says, and He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in Me, and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see Me, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So Jesus has previously told them that the Holy Spirit will provide them with the spiritual comfort that He, Jesus Himself, had provided them while He was there. He'll be the comforter. He will comfort you. He also has told them that the Spirit would help them remember His teachings and enable them to remain in fellowship with Himself and the Father even when not physically uh, present with them. Remember He says, I'll bring to your remembrance you know, three years of teaching and so on and so forth. So he says, the Holy Spirit will help you remember what I've taught you, help you to know how to apply the things that I've taught you. This time, 
Jesus focuses more on what the Holy Spirit will do through them in the world, what His impact on the world will be. And so basically the Holy Spirit will convict, he says. Comes from a root word meaning to prove with evidence, to find fault, to convict. Now Jesus speaks of the Spirit's work as it is in total. In other words, what the Spirit will accomplish when all is said and done, when the cross and the resurrection and the apostles' preaching is, is begun and the establishment of the church, the life of the church until the second coming of Jesus, the judging of the world and, he and, and heaven, the glorification of the church, all of, all of these things the Spirit will be involved in is the point here. So the, concerning the total of the Holy Spirit's work, Jesus says He'll convict the world of three things. Now convict means to find and prove with evidence a certain fault. So Jesus says the Holy Spirit will convict the world of first, sin. He will show that the world is guilty of the most grievous sin, and you know what that is? Not murder, it's disbelief. Disbelief is the worst sin, because you can't be forgiven of disbelief. <laughs> you can be forgiven of murder, you can be forgiven of rape, child molestation, you know, think of the worst things a person could do, right? You can be forgiven of those things, but you can't be forgiven of disbelief. That's the worst sin. He will spread the gospel everywhere, speaking of the Holy Spirit, and prove in the end that the majority in the world will have disbelieved. That's how He convicts the world. Number two, He'll convict the world of righteousness. In other words, He's going to show that the world will seek righteousness in other ways besides the only way that God has provided it, and that's through the cross of Christ. So Jesus mentions the cross in a kind of oblique way. You know, when He says, I go to the Father, you no longer see me, that's what He means. His departure and His death and then His ascension, they're because of the cross. His departure through resurrection and ascension confirmed the work and the power of the cross to, confirm, uh, to confer forgiveness and righteousness. In other words, His cross is the thing that helps us be forgiven, okay? So the point is the Holy Spirit, by His work through the apostles, will convict the world of having rejected this avenue to righteousness by the cross in favor of other ways to be right with God. That's what he means. You know, the world will choose to be right with God through other types of religion or through works or not even care about being right with God. That's, that's what he's saying. So there's only one way to be right with God and that's through the cross of Christ, you know, vicarious atonement, only one way through faith and so to convict the world of righteousness is to convict the world of the way that the world will seek righteousness. And then thirdly, he says, judgment. The cross engenders belief, it produces righteousness, but it also condemns and binds Satan forever. Hebrews 2.15. So the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world concerning the sure judgment to come, by pointing to the judgment and condemnation of the ruler of this world who has already been judged. In other words, the Holy Spirit will prove there is a judgment and that it will be for sin by bringing the judgment of Satan to the attention of the world. You know, the point is, look, if Satan is judged, his followers will be judged. And if God is great enough to judge Satan, who's a powerful being, and He's great enough to judge you. If God had judged this mighty spiritual being for His disobedience, the idea is He can and He will judge you. Now a third detail concerning the Holy Spirit, remember we said one, the condition of His coming, two, the work of the Spirit, and then thirdly, the way the Spirit will work. We're still talking about the first promise. You know? He promises them four things. The first thing He promises is the Holy Spirit, and then we've kind of subcategorized, you know what I mean, the condition of the Spirit, the condition of His coming, His work. And then He also talks about the way that the Spirit will work. And so in giving details concerning the Holy Spirit, Jesus has said that the Holy Spirit will be given 
only when his own ministry is completed and he returns to the Father. Now he said that the Holy Spirit will work to convict or demonstrate the world's fault concerning disbelief and righteousness and judgment and so on and so forth. In this section, the Lord spells out how the Spirit will do not only His work of convicting, but also His work of comforting as well. So let's read verse 12. He says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So Jesus, knowing their limits, doesn't go into too much detail. Could you imagine hearing this information about the Holy Spirit for the first time? I mean, you're reeling with the idea that He's saying, look, pretty soon they're going to kill me. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to resurrect from the dead. And by the way, I'm going to go back to heaven. Poof! And by the way, I'm going to send the Spirit and the Spirit's going to convict the world. You know, you, wow, I mean, it's like, you know, well, what do we say now? I can't get my whole mind around, I can't get my brain wrapped around it. Can you imagine all this information? So he has to kind of give it in small, dra small portions. And so knowing their limits, he doesn't go into too much detail. After the passion, they will be better able to understand his words. You know, so like enough for now. Later on you'll be able to understand what I'm talking about. Verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. And so the details about what he has just said and the ability to understand it will be the result of his power working in them. Not only what Jesus has said and what it means, but what things are to come in the future. In other words, you know, Peter and John, they speak of the future events and the end of the world in their epistles. So if you read Peter and John and other, you know, their epistles, they talk about what will happen at the end of the world. Well, they couldn't talk about that now. They didn't have the, the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. So Jesus is saying, don't worry, you'll understand what I'm talking about, you'll know how to apply what I've taught you, and you'll also be able to know the things that are coming even into the future. Okay? Verse 14, he will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. Jesus will be glorified through the preaching of his word and the expressing of his powers through the apostles. That's how Jesus is glorified. And this will be made possible through the Holy Spirit. And this ongoing witness will be what the Spirit uses to convict the world. If no one witnessed the words, the power, and the person of Jesus, then there would be no conviction. But the witness has been going on for 2,000 years and will continue until he returns. So as Paul says in, Corin uh, in, Corinthians, in, in Romans, they are without excuse. They are without excuse for 2,000 years. And it's interesting, there's a popular book that's out, uh, you know, Bill O'Reilly, the, the, the commentator and so on and so forth. He's got this book out called Killing, Killing Jesus, the historical account of the killing of Jesus. And he said, I haven't read it yet, but from what I understand, it's about the, you know, the history of what happened. He goes through Roman records and so on and so forth. And he's, he, say, he says, it's not a book of theology, it's simply a history book. What happened to this person, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, some 2,000 years? And what's interesting is that it's the number one selling book in the world. <laughs> it's the number one selling book in the world. Tell me that there's no interest in Jesus. When it's just a popular book, it's not even, you know, he's not claiming inspiration, he's just giving you the historical record of something that all of us, I mean, pretty much everybody who knows anything about Christianity knows that Jesus died. Now whether they believe He resurrected or not, it's a whole other issue. So people are flocking to buy a book about something they already know. In other words, they already know the ending. So it shows you the power of the work that goes on in the world, spreading the, the name of Jesus, even to this day and even in, our, uh, even in our generation. So when Paul says they are without excuse, he's not, he's not kidding. All right, verse 15. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that He takes of mine and will disclose it to you. He reassures them now that what they will receive from the Holy Spirit will be directly and completely from Him and that everything He has, He has, given, uh, he has been given by the Father 
and he has all that the Father has. In other words, this section and the first promise of sending the Holy Spirit ends in another declaration of Jesus' divinity. I mean, who else but God could say, well, the Father has given me everything that He has. No man, no woman could make that claim. And everything that He has given to me, I'm going to give to you through the Holy Spirit. Okay. Promise number two, we need to move. The imminence of His passion. It's not kind of a promise. Oh, I promise I'll do this for you. The promise is, better believe that what I told you is going to happen to me is going to happen to me. Jesus leaves off His discussion of the Holy Spirit. He refocuses them in the very present time of His imminent death and resurrection. Yeah, it's true. He must first go before He can send the Spirit and the time for His departure is now. Not some nebulous future time. It's right now. So in verse 16 he says, a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. So he makes reference to his death and resurrection by saying that both will take place very soon. You know, a little while you won't see me, that's his death. And then a little while you will see me, that's his resurrection. Verse 17 and 18. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. So they were saying, what is this that he says, a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. And so the apostles are speaking among themselves. They're not wishing to ask Jesus a direct question. You know, they've had enough. <laughs> we don't want to ask another question. My brain hurts. So they're especially curious about the immediacy of what's going to take place. What does he mean by a little while? So let's keep going, verse 19 and 20. Jesus knew that they wished to question him and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this, that I said a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. So he tells them that what will happen to him will cause them great sorrow and their adversaries great rejoicing. But their sorrow will be turned into joy. Again, Jesus foretelling of the effects of his death and resurrection, not only on the world and on believers, but also the effect of his resurrection on them. 21 and 22. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come, but when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. So of course, he compares the experience of sorrow and pain followed by joy to that of a woman giving birth to a child. You know, there's fear, there's pain, there's sorrow during the labor, but once the baby is born, of course, this is replaced by joy, and then when they grow up and become teenagers, then that's replaced again by sorrow. But anyways, that's a whole other, that's a whole other issue. So Jesus promises that a time of sorrow and pain is coming soon, but it'll be uh, short-lived and their joy will repeat. Okay, promise number three. Their prayers will be answered. Their prayers will be, Jesus continuing His teaching, He looks ahead to the time when His work on the cross will be complete, His resurrection and ascension also complete, the Holy Spirit is sent, and He promises one other thing which will take place at that time. So let's read verse 23 and 24. He says, in that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, He will give it to you. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. So until now he's prayed for them. But now he says that they are to pray to God themselves in His name. That, 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 that's the transfer. That's why we do it in His name. Because He's not praying for us anymore. We pray, we do the praying and we do it in His, in his name. And when they do, Jesus says, God will answer their request. Now, I want you to realize something here. This is one of the most abused passages in the Bible right here. Realize that Jesus is speaking to the apostles concerning the work of the Holy Spirit and their task as witnesses. Some people think, well, if I ask for a new truck in His name, 
you know, I've got the right combo to get my new truck. This is not what he's talking about here. He's saying whatever the apostles ask in this context, in the context of the Spirit accomplishing His work through them. That's what he's talking about. For example, uh, what they ask in this context, God will give. For example, apostles doing miracles, or apostles raising the dead, or apostles asking to give power to other people, or apostles asking for wisdom and direction in their ministry. That's what he's talking about. Whatever you, whatever you the apostles, ask in my name, in what context, in the spirit completing the work in the world, whatever you ask for that, I'm going to give you. So they're going to see Jesus no, no more after He is ascended, but their prayers constantly answered in, the name, in His name confirms His words and promises and it gives them the joy of hope, the anticipation of their own reward. Again, I don't want to discourage you. Of course, if we, you know, the passage you know, that, that deals with us and our prayer is not this passage. It's the passage where Jesus is saying, ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, the door will be open. That, that's for us. You know? That's for us. He's assuring us if, if we ask God and continue to ask God and so on and so forth. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, God, uh, Jesus said, God already knows what you need. Right? So that's the passage that deals with, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Maybe our daily bread one day is, you know, we need another truck because ours is just broken down. You know, okay, that's fine, that's legit. But let's not use this passage here. This passage, he's talking to the apostles. Whatever you ask in the context of the Spirit fulfilling the work, whatever you ask in that context, you'll be given. And we see it, isn't it? Their prayers are answered. They do miracles, they raise the dead, they spread the word, they have wisdom, they write the, 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 the gospels and the epistles. All right, promise number four. Promise number four is your faith will be shaken. Your faith will be shaken. Verse 25, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father Himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. So Jesus explains to them that despite their, confession, uh, their confusion now, they will understand what will happen and what to pray for more clearly later on. He also, uh, he also encourages them by telling them that because of their initial belief, the Father loves them. He repeats once again in a general way the sequence of events. He came from the Father, He was in the world, and now He goes back to the Father. Verse 29 and 30, His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. So the apostles who were kind of whispering their doubts and questions among themselves before, now openly and loudly claim their belief. Even though he has spoken in figurative language, the fact that he knows their questions before they ask them, and that he has spoken with authority and more clarity than anyone else, that's enough. It's sufficient for them to confess their faith in him. Now there may be more information and explaining to come later on, but they've got enough now to declare, to declare their faith. This is the last time that they're going to do this before his death. Keep reading. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. You know, just when they thought they were getting it. Just when they thought, I think I'm starting to see daylight. You know, I, I'm getting it. He, okay, you're the son of God. Let's say, we do believe you. We're good to go. 
he, he tells them, yeah, well, there's this little issue of you abandoning me first, you know? So his answer is surprising in that at this moment when they're confessing their faith, he prophesizes about their fall from faith caused by his arrest, torture, and death. You know, it's unusual that he uses this failure of faith as a way to build their faith in the future. You know, he says, don't worry, even though you leave me, I'll not be alone. The Father will be with me. Remember all of the things, including this prediction of your downfall, downfall so that you can believe or renew your faith when I'm, when I'm gone. You know, we say that to our kids, don't we? And when they're little, I remember used to saying that to my youngest, I said, well, William, you know, I want you to, William, you're not going to get older than 10 years old, are you? And he'd say, no, daddy, I'm not, I'm going to always stay 10 years old. Because right now you're daddy's little boy, you know, and uh, you know when they're at that sweet, that sweet age there, no guile, and they, they just want to be with you, you know, and I'd say, yeah. And I'd say to him, you know, in a, a bit of a joke, you know, I'd say, yeah, but one day, you know, one day you won't want to be daddy's boy. No, no, that'll never happen, dad. But we know that, right? We know they grow up, they get to be teens, they want to be themselves. They, the last thing they want to do is be with their parents. But we know eventually, if we live long enough, they, they come back around, hopefully, you know, to, to wanting to be with, well, you know, that's the sense and the spirit here. Jesus knows what's going to happen with these guys. And he says, yeah, you're with me now. I'm telling you, there's a big fall that's coming, but I don't want you to be discouraged because I know that you'll come back to me. All right. So in the end, as I said, he encourages them by telling them that even at the darkest hour when he is gone and they are burdened by their own guilt, remember that he has won the victory over sin and death. So Jesus promises them four things as he finishes his time with them in the upper room. And just to review, first, that the Holy Spirit will be given to them after he is gone. And of course he explains in detail all the things that the Spirit will do in them and through them. Secondly, he tells them, promises them, this is the end, there's no more. We're, we're getting to the climax of my mission here. He promises that this is the end and it's going to happen the way he says it's going to happen. Thirdly, um, not to be discouraged because their prayers will be honored in heaven. And the point here is not so much, you know, they've already prayed. It's just that he'll be gone. And they're not used to not having him around doing the praying. And so he's encouraging them, saying, hey, you know what? Your prayers will be effective. Don't worry about that, that I'm not here with you. Your prayers will be effective. That's the promise that he makes. And then finally, uh, he warns them, well, not warns them, but he alerts them to the idea that there's a, there's a, a bad patch coming for them. You know, their downfall but their faith will be renewed and, and not to be completely discouraged when it happens. Okay, so next time we get together, we're going to cover the last part of his long teaching section in the upper room, uh, commonly referred to as the high, um, as the high, priestly, uh, high priestly prayer. All right, so long, long section here of, of talk and teaching uh, by Jesus for his apostles. All right, that's it for this time. Thank you for your attention.